people in. So far, we've got 14. Okay. So you can, you're letting people in, are you, Hugo? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, I will be. Great. Oh, God. Sorry about that. I failed on the PowerPoint. <laughs> Hi. I think so. Hi, Lara. Hi, Handle Street Project. Hi. Fetcher. Hi, good to see you. Hi, hi. Hi. These are my, my lovely helpers from oh. Queen's College. They come every Wednesday to help me in the gallery. So I thought That's it's a lovely. good opportunity for them to see something from a fabulous nothing in contemporary. And I've heard some good, good words about the exhibition. Oh, cool. you've got to come and see it. You have to go. I will. I will. It's a uh, uh, good to go up north and. Yes, and absolutely. Come up to, uh... Brilliant. Good. I'm glad you came. So we're just um, waiting, and um, yeah, you could. Can we mute ourselves? Yes, yeah, you can mute. If everybody mutes themselves and their cameras, um, we're going to start the the show. Brilliant. I'm just so glad you came. Right, welcome everybody. It's three minutes past two um, to the Leicester Gallery um, Open Talks at De Montfort University. Um, it's being run by Fine Art and Photography and Video. Um, and I'm really happy today and very, very excited to welcome the artist Grace Inderitu, who um, is uh, currently got a show at the, um, uh, Nottingham Contemporary, Our Silver City. Um, that you've all got to go and see. Um, and she's curating in it with a group of curators, as well as some of her works featured in it. And it's, as you know, been in The Guardian, um, favorably reviewed. Um, Grace, a British Kenyan artist um, who's been using performance and photography and film in her work. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of just hand you over for just a few minutes to say hi. Hi, Grace. Hi, everyone. I can't see anyone apart from Lala. So I just yes. see the names of people's, um, you know, yes. names. But that's fine. I just say hello. <laughs> well, I think at the end, I'll uh, make sure everyone's dressed because I'll ask you all to switch your camera <laughs> and give Grace a clap at the end. Um, but also, if you've got questions, We'll ask you to um, turn on your camera and ask your question yourself. But you can also type it um, in the type any questions that you've got. Um, so I'm going to start um, with my first question. I've made eight questions for you. Um, so I want to ask you, why do you work the way that you work? OK, so Hugo, could you start the PowerPoint, please? With pleasure, I'll bring that up. So we're going to have a PowerPoint with different images uh, for my practice. Uh, Lala actually chose the images, um, but we're going to just have, have them playing and then um, we'll be talking over them. Great. Yeah. So if you can just play it as a slideshow, that'd be great. That should work. Let's have a look. Okay, we're getting the slideshow up here, guys. I don't know what's that camera <laughs> I've taken a screenshot of the whole slideshow and you guys <laughs> to, as a memory <laughs> yes we saw your memories uh, oh yeah that was that was funny <laughs> we, um, had, we, we showed me and Grace had showed in 2009 in, a, in an exhibition that's when I first met Grace 
and um, I hauled up some rubbish mobile phone photographs, hoping they'd be good, but no. <laughs> they were really funny. <laughs> it was in Kosovo, wasn't it? Yes, we showed in Kosovo National Gallery. Exactly. Yeah. So that's when I first met Grace. <laughs> Great. So are you going to do a, a screen show, show of it? That's okay. it. Great. So... Yeah, you can just start it. It's fine. Yeah, I think so. Just, just. Um, so my first question is, why do you work the way that you work? Okay, so maybe it's good to say a little bit about my background. Um, so my background's actually in textile art. Originally, I studied that. Um, and, um, and then I went on to be working in Amsterdam. Um, well, actually studying in Amsterdam, I did like a postgraduate study, like an MA uh, at a school called Ateliers. And at that school, I'd, I started making video art and um, I started experimenting with different things. Um, and so that was one of the key factors of like, when I was, met, when I was at Winchester doing textile art, I always felt kind of restricted. I always felt like I wanted to do many different types of mediums, but I wasn't sure how to do it. And so I bought myself a video camera and just was, you know, um, self-teaching myself. But at Ateliers, we had many great teachers like uh, Stan Douglas, um, Steve McQueen, Marlene Dumas, um, Tacita Dean. So it was like really inspiring as a place. Um, also, my family background is my family is from um, Kenya, uh, but I grew up there in rural Kenya, but also in Birmingham, in working class Birmingham. And so I had many of these contrasts in terms of culturally and historically in my head. And my mother is a feminist, so I grew up in quite a political household as well. And so I think that also shaped the way that I started to make work from the very beginning, um, coupled with the fact that after I graduated from Ateliers, I also started living a bit of a double life. So since I was a child, I was already kind of interested in quite esoteric things, um, uh, different practices, um, it, especially in Kenya, because it, it, we're in a very rural place where there's a lot of wild animals. And so um, this started to affect my practice, my art practice, um, but I didn't find there was much kind of room for that kind of conversation about spirituality at that time in the art world. And so I kind of felt like, you know, people were kind of quite rude or made fun of it. Um, so I kind of had this weird double life of being doing very esoteric things like having a guru going on retreats, but also, you know, um, you know, doing um, contemporary art shows um, and which were kind of, my work was already kind of political. And so then in 2012, that's when my practice really changed. And I started to bring the spirituality even more, you know, into my work and um, mixed up with the political uh, aspect of it. Um, Hugo, do you want to, if you, if you can't play it automatically, maybe we can just do one by one or something. Okay, so yeah, just if you just change them like every five seconds or something with your own rhythm. Okay, so I think, yeah, I think, did that answer your first question? Yep, yep. Um, what's your ambition in your, with your work? Yeah, so I would say um, the ambition with my work is to always tell some sort of truth um, and to make work that's kind of authentic. I mean, that doesn't mean it's dogmatic. It could be funny, it could be beautiful, it could be ironic, um, it can be ambiguous, but also always thinking about some sort of, um, yeah, some sort of truth. Uh, so one of my early videos, The Nightingale, which I showed at the ICOM uh, in 2005, that was made through a process where I had learned to put myself in a state of trance and so I knew if I put myself in a state of trance in front of the camera, that um, the performative aspect would be more authentic. 
because I wasn't really interested in acting, you know, or being theatrical. And yeah. so this way of making video art, that's how I got into make it, was like to put myself in trance, turn the camera on, put myself in trance, and then look at the footage afterwards. This also affected later on, um, there's some images uh, that will come up um, of um, Hugo, Hugo. I don't know, maybe it's better to, if you go back to the main view of all the images, all the images lined up in a grid format. Maybe I'll just point at the image that we could, you know, look at, it might be easier. So that's at the bottom, is there that tile view? Yeah, tile view, that's a good idea. Yeah. So for example, what you're seeing now, the one of, um, yeah. yeah. So at the bottom, if you go down where you see me banging a drum, like number 15. Yes. I love that one. I love that. So this is an image from a performance series um, I call Healing the Museum. And so when I was talking about authenticity, this is also came into when I started doing live performance work. Um, you can go to the next slide, number 16. Um, then, um, yeah, this came through, so, and 17 as well. Yeah, and 18. Yeah, so in it kind of like when doing sh live shamanic performances with kind of, you know, issues, uh, sorry, um, with different types of audiences in museums, um, this aspect of having to kind of tell the truth or be true was really important. And that also comes through in my type of social practice projects um, as well, where I've been working with different groups of people like refugees, um, migrants, um, people that work at the UN or NATO or the parliament. Um, and so, yeah, this kind of, you know, ambition is uh, important. Yes, really great works really good to see them you know in still um my other question was who and what are you fighting against in your work yeah that that was a good interesting question as well and so um i guess it, it depends on what's really making me angry at the time <laughs> you could say so for like things like healing museum Healing the Museum was a project that I started in 2012. And this was because I was kind of, you know, really feeling, you know, fed up with museums in the sense of them feeling, I felt like they were very disconnected with what was going on outside in the real world. Uh, so politically and socially. And so I came up with this idea of wanting to introduce, you know, reintroduce kind of like non-rational methodologies into museums. So meaning shamanism or meditation and to kind of reactivate the museum back into being in a way. So you'd have like new audiences and new energies. And this came to a, a kind of a head in one example. So I could give an example of that. Um, so there was a project from the Goethe Institute, institution um, who were, they were kind of investigating the restitution of objects back to Africa. So I'm sure you all know the, the debate that's going on about that. And so um, a group of like um, scientists, academics, museum directors, activists and artists were brought together uh, from Africa and also from Europe. And we were, had these closed workshops over two years. So in the Africa Museum in Brussels, in Ethnographic Museum in Barcelona, in Italy and in France. And the idea was to kind of debate and look at this issue, because it's a very complicated issue. And so what was really fascinating was, with that was how, you know, this kind of intersection of um, the social and the political and the spiritual came together, especially in, in my practice, let's say. And so, uh, on the in the background of this, um, remember in 2016 um, there was a thing called the Macron report. So this was a report given to the president, uh, the French president Macron, about restitution of objects. 
And then so Merkel, she had wanted her own report. And so the Goethe Institute, that was kind of also part of the thing about how to influence this new report. So what I did um, in the closed workshop, so in the African Museum, so we'd have like a normal conference in the morning, you know, with um, academics giving their research papers. But what I decided to do is to bring everybody into the gem and mineral room. So um, in the museum. So this is a room that's full of dark, well, it's full of gems, minerals, precious stones. Um, one could say blood diamonds because they're uh, materials that have been taken from the Congo, um, you know, um, when it was colonized by Belgium. And so I got everyone to sit on the floor, including the muse museum director, who had never, funnily enough, sat on the floor of his own museum. <laughs> And so it was like quite a big thing for him to sit on the floor. But then for us to kind of meditate in that room together. Uh, but then something very interesting happened because um, if we go back to the tile windows. Yeah. So if you go to uh, number six, image number six. Oh, yes, yes. So this this isn't actually in the African Museum, but this gives an example of like um, what we would do when working together. So um, so imagine, so we're in this gem and mineral room meditating. And then um, some of the scientists and artists and activists from the Congo who were part of the project, they start to get very upset because obviously they were tapping into the energy of, you know, of you know, the, you know, the, the horrific nature of how the, you know, objects got to the museum. Yeah. And so they, so the whole pr process became very cathartic. And then um, after the performance, when we went back into like the normal conference mode, what happened was that it was, um, it made the conversation much more deeper um, because, it, you know, we bonded and we'd all gone through this thing together. So, when we were discussing very practical things like, you know, the legal ramifications of sending objects back together, I mean, back to Africa, or the, you know, the practical um, application of doing it. Um, because we've kind of been through this psycho-spiritual experience, it meant that the group weirdly bonded, even though, you know, you had people who, who were very anti um, some museums and people who were very full in, 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 in the workshop, you know. And so I found, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, this is an image from a project I did in Vancouver called Healing Justice, um, where we were writing, in this moment, we are writing love letters to strangers. I found a kind of I kind of form different kind of methodologies of being able to work with different types of people. And um, for example, doing holistic uh, reading rooms or um, where you read texts and you meditate or yeah, I kind of spent quite a few years coming up with these kind of ways of activating audiences um, in museums. What was the, where was the one done in the slide? Previously, which museum was that in? That was in the Museum of Modern Art in Paris, which was just recently in June, so after Corona, because actually it was meant to happen, I don't know, last year or whatever, but it couldn't. Uh, but it was called, it was about women's strikes, so like more the feminist movement in the 70s, uh, but mixed also today, like bring it up today um, to talk about decolonizing museums as well. And yeah, it was a really powerful experience. And I make these things I call protest carpets. So the things that people sit on, um, you know, they're, they're works of art in them by themselves, but then they can get activated by audiences. Um, and um, do, are you getting sort of calls from museums to come and um, sort of do workshops to, you know? Something? Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, cause I've been doing healing in museums since 2012 and, I'd always done like one or two things a year, let's say, but recently it's been very full on, you know, you okay. know every other week or I don't know, at least once a month, I guess. Oh, no, I, I think it's brilliant. 
I, I can imagine um, museums thinking, well, we need to call Grace to come and heal us. You know what I mean? It's a sort yes. of like service. You should come with a van, you know. <laughs> man with a van. <laughs> yeah. You know, instead of getting the roof done or something, we're going to call Grace Healing Services, Museum Healing Services. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> uh, so my other question was, where do you see yourself in five years' time? If your work is successful, what does success look like? I mean, I guess that's a good question. I was like, oh, that's an interesting question. So actually, I guess maybe moving away from social practice, because social practice is exhausting, you know, working yes. with groups of people. So for me, I would like to publish more books. And so, uh, yes, I know that you've also been reading my book. This is my first book yes. called Descent Without Modification. Um, yes. You it's can buy it online. All you students, this is going to be in the library, two copies in the library. Yeah. Yeah, it's that, it's that thick. Yeah, it is. It's like a brick. So this is a book of um, interviews I've done with radical women. So um, they're long form interviews. So ones with a hacker, with a photographer, with artists, activists, um, some African, American, European. And we talk about everything. We talk about sex, um, money, interracial relationships, the art world. Um, yeah, we cover a lot of different subjects and it's a, it's a project that's dear to my heart because I began in 2013 and, you know, I started doing these interviews just self-funded myself, you know, and getting them transcribed one by one. But it was really hard to find a publisher for them because not everyone is famous in the book. Um, but I found the stories really inspiring. And, you know, these women eventually, I, I, you know, when I first met them, not all of them were like friends. It was like, there were new friends in the first six months or one year that each interview was done. Um, but I felt like they were worthwhile conversations. Uh, for example, with Monster Chetwin, um, the conversation, there's a lot about funding in there, which actually might be interesting for the students to read. Um, I think that I would like to write more books. And also, we've recently started making films. So for many years, I was made video art. Um, and so the first picture where you saw at the cinema, that was like a nice, fun evening, kind of, a, um, I wouldn't say retrospective, but like it was, um, I showed many uh, pieces of video art at the cinema in London, uh, Prince Charles uh, cinema. Um, but that was in 2009, I think, too, that just as when we met, actually. Um, yeah. But over the years, I've been working with Lux a lot, um, you know, Lux in London. But now I'd started working um, on longer films. So uh, films with scripts, you know, started writing scripts and also um, working with a team. So it's much more technically challenging, but you can do many more cinematic things. And so one of the films is actually in Coventry Biennale at the moment. So if anybody's going to Coventry, or the Midlands uh, to see the Turner Prize. It's in the same building as the Turner Prize. So it's actually worth going to see because it's because the Turner Prize is a lot about social practice and yes. community groups, whereas the Coventry Biennale, it's much more time-based or object-based. So it's a good contrast to have in the same building. Um, and I think the reason why I would like to continue those two things more and more is because I really, my favorite types of artists are artists like Mike Kelly or Jim, Jimmy Durham. Um, artists who, um, it doesn't really matter what the medium is that they're using, it's more about the idea. And so I really like being able to work, whether it's writing or film or textiles or, you know, performance. I like this, you know, more wide ranging point of view. Um, maybe we could go back to the tiled uh, images. Yeah, so for, yeah, talking of that is uh, something recent. So we could talk about um, number 19, please. So these are from some tapestries that I've recently made, because recently I've started working a lot with textiles again, weirdly enough. Oh. And then, um, on, t on 20, 
this is um, an image from the show at Nottingham where some of my tapestries are there and also other people's tapestries are in the room. So we, there's works from Annie Albers, Andrew Zittel, Adam Bletchley. And so I've kind of created this space called the temple. Um, and so I designed this wooden structure like as a kind of museum display, but also kind of as a place where we can have spiritual um, uh, gatherings. Um, so for the inauguration of that, I did a shamanic performance called Labour, where we invited 10 pregnant women uh, to come in the second and third trimester to go on a shamanic journey. And it was called Labour, Birth of a New Museum. And the idea was to connect with this unborn art audience, you know, and to start to think about different generations, because obviously, I um, mean, the, the show is set in 2094. It's called uh, Our Silver City, 2094. So it's about the end of the century. And all the babies born today are going to be alive in 2094. But the world will be quite different. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I was interested in how to work, you know, and um, tap into that kind of energy and that kind of mind focus. Even even now, even before they're born, um, yes. to see how that develops, you know, as they grow up. Were there any babies kicking in the the tummies, and did the mums feel some response? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they all saw things, and they all felt the babies very strongly, and they all got messages of what they needed to know. Um, so yeah, it was a very powerful experience actually. But the nice thing about the gallery, the the, the temple space, is that you, you when you go in, you have to take off your shoes, and it's quite a quiet, con contemplative place where you can sit. We have these bean banks where you can sit for like quite a long time. I mean, that's what Adrian Sill in the garden. Somebody told me he was in there for like hours, like just sitting in there, uh, which was funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are other great galleries as well, like Celine Condrelli has designed a gallery, and that's much more, that's more spectacular in terms of like music and the visual aspect of, you know, audiovisual aspect and um, this huge curtain that's like, I don't know, 10 metres long is in there. So every gallery in the show has been designed by a different artist, and um, we've been working together with the curators as well. Uh, for the project for the last two years. So we're really happy it finally opened. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. It's one of those that uh, it really looks good because often stills don't really, uh, but that just looks so beautiful. Just the still of the show it really makes you want to go because um, of the sun, the roof, they've really caught the roof and it's it's really lovely. Thank you, thank you. And so what, um, what, what does success look like was the other part. So if you're successful in your ambitions, mm. actually look like. <laughs> That's that, that bit I couldn't, that was hard. I mean, I guess it's always, yes, if, if I published a certain type of book or if I managed to make a feature film, that would be a big success because till now I've only made short films, two short films, you know, so managing to do something like that. But if you mean in life, I mean, hopefully, hopefully I'm still being alive and being able to practice and, you know, live off my work and, you know, do those things, considering we don't know what's going to happen with climate and, yeah, you know, COVID and, well, other pandemics and stuff, you know. So, yeah, just it still keep going. That, yeah. That's what success will look like, I guess. Um, and I was just putting these questions in, but um, they're going to open it up soon to the students. But um, what's the time? We've still got. Yeah. Um, have the liberal left lost their argument? And are the real issues being lost like poverty, social injustice and inequality? Yeah, that, that's a good. If we go back to the main slides. And we go to number, actually number two, let's start there. This is an image of a project I did in Paris called The Arc, uh, where I started my own community off grid and invited artists and scientists and spiritual people to live together. Um, and this was after an extended uh, amount of time 
actually going to live in different types of communities in rural areas. But to answer your question, has the liberal left lost the argument? I think it's good to refer, you know, because I've been writing a lot of essays in the last few years. Um, I wrote an essay called Healing the Museum and a second one also about how we value objects. Um, but I've also been writing a lot of essays about race and um, class. And uh, when Trump was elected, uh, I was so annoyed by it, like everyone else. <laughs> Uh, but I decided to write um, some essays. So I had essays, titles, for example, as A Call to White America, Notes to the White Left, um, Love in the Time of Trump, um, and uh, The Healing of America. So that's when Biden was elected last year. And so these essays kind of chart the last uh, Trump's uh, presidency. But they also chart also what's happened to the left, you know. Um, I mean, for me personally, I don't think the left has lost. Um, what did you say that the issue, real issues are being yeah, lost? It's lost <laughs> argument. Yeah, like in the sense of like, if we want to survive and continue life during climate change, we need to work together. So, you know, it's. It's, there's always this thing of having to learn from each other. As we see, you know, for example, in the pandemic, what's happened in the art world anyway, um, that a lot of things to do with community and social practice have suddenly become much more um, important, you know. So, because I would say before the pandemic, the art world was more 70% market focused and 30%, let's say, community social practice. Um, roughly, and then during the pandemic, like especially last year, it flipped much more to like 70% social practice and then 30% market. And now it's like 50-50. And so, you know, I'd say that the left, the, the issue with the left is that the left needs to kind of look at itself because it's always easy to look at the right, you know, and blame it but it's hard for the left to look at its own sexism and its own racism that happens. And I think until that's resolved, that nothing can get moved forward in a sense, you know, cause I, I lived in Texas for one year, I did a residency there and you know, and everyone, you know, when you hear the word Texas, most people are like, oh my God, Texas, you know, it's really Republican and a red state. And it is like that, but then there's also a very, uh, open-mindedness, freedom, a wild wildness to it, let's say, in a way that I've never experienced in any other Western country, let's say. And then also, you know, you can be left in Texas. You know, I don't mean in Austin. I mean, I, was, I wasn't living in Austin. I was living in um, Galveston. But, you know, living in Texas taught me a lot about how on the news it will say one thing, you know, because Texans may vote in one way, Republican, but actually in the day to day, it's actually quite integrated. I would say more integrated than liberal places like California or Los Angeles, weirdly enough. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of hypocrisy or things in the left that still need to be looked at. Yeah, that's really great answers. Um, so now I want to open it up and, um, get anybody who's got a question would they like to put your hand up we'll do it like that and um turn your screen on anything you like um i, I could just say something about a uh, slide four and five okay yeah. Then, yeah say say something about slide four or five then we'll have the question yeah. So this is an image from my fashion project. So I have this other project called uh, Cover Slut, which is a fashion and economic project. Um, and so the idea with Cover Slut was like about how to kind of, you know, make a fashion label, which wasn't a normal fashion label in the sense I wasn't interested in autumn, um, winter, spring, summer collections. I wasn't interested in doing normal catwalks. Um, Cover Slut really is about questioning who has the right to be fashionable. So its focus is a lot about democracy, class, race, but also it looks at economics. So it's a pay what you can fashion brand, but also um, it takes, you know, bits from capitalism, bits from, um, so for example, we have white t-shirts, which we make. If you go to the next slide, please. 
can see some of the people wearing them. So some of these white t-shirts are from Cover Slut. This is actually from uh, one of the last uh, manifestations we did. Um, we did a mass catwalk uh, with all the different ranges um, from the collection. Uh, this was in 2018 in the, 2019 in the summer. Um, and yeah, we did it as a protest. And so we cover slut at first, the first collection was based in Ghent, um, uh, the first edition, I should say. Um, and there I worked with migrants and Turkish migrants, refugees, and also um, artists from the local art school uh, to make the different collections. And then afterwards we would do events. So we'd do events at, um, you know, um, youth centers or we do events, we do pop up events at like East Side Projects, for example, or in art fairs. So we had like a really mixed economy. So, for example, with um, the white t shirts, um, we have slogans on them. So, slogans like Alpha Male or Descent or um, Black Cock. And then we sell these t shirts as pay what you can. And then from that money, we um, then make an ecological collection. So if you go back to the slide before, that's from the ecological collection um, that came after like 18 months of working on cover slut and doing these different things. So this was a project that I'd actually first thought about in 2010, but it took until 2018 to find a textile studio who could do this. And it's because, you know, People's, you could say people weren't very open to these ways of working or thinking, you know, in 2010. And so it's taken till now for, you know, the art world to be interested in, let's say, on a mass scale, you know, to do with social injustice or to do with um, uh, spirituality, community, all the things that I'm interested in. Now it seems to be more relevant. And I should say um, cover slut. So for cover slut, you can go to the Apple. Do you know the Apple yes. in Amsterdam? Um, so yeah, they're, they're a really great space and they have a cover slut shop online and we sell everything as pay what you can online as well. We'll all be going the Apple, everybody. I'll type it in. So, um, so um, shall I go to the first question? Yeah. So, um, so Fedja, on Handle Street projects, um, if you put your camera on and your, that's it, great. Hi, gr great. I mean, um, congratulations, Grace. I mean, I can't wait to come to Nottingham and, and see your show. And by the way, it's The Apple, and it's really important gallery dating back to early 70s. They were pioneers of uh, showing uh, video art before anyone else in Europe did really important mm -hmm. place. But um, uh, uh, Grace, you said something earlier, and uh, please don't move away from social aspects of your <laughs> uh, I know, I know it's exhausting, but what you're, what you're doing is extremely important. We need today to rethink whole concept of art, not only art, mm -hmm. but of our yeah. society and ways we mm -hmm. live, and this thing with Corona is a big alarm call for all sorts of issues that arose through it or they were already there, but we were ignoring them. So don't move away, keep on doing it. <laughs> don't please aspire. I'm so sorry. I'm an old man. I can speak like this. Yeah. <laughs> don't aspire to that glamorous side of the art world, which is futile and it's a living dead <laughs> which is basically kept alive by the art market and mm. money. Mm. You don't want to go there. What you do? <laughs> do you know this fabulous mm. book? And in fact, I'm going to be talking to him this Sunday in Freud Museum. Mm. Um, uh, this lovely book, an important and brave book called The Brutish Museums by Professor Dan Hicks. And basically wow. premises that all museums in the Western world are built on stolen goods. Mm -hmm. So he's talking about that, but he's talking also about the uh, uh, restitution uh, as well, which is very complex uh, process. So the colonization needs to happen here, but it needs to happen 
there as well in a very different different way. So I'm sorry, there are no questions, <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to say this and again, congratulations on your show. Okay. Hey, thank, thank you. You can make that's good. You can also make comments like Fedger. That's fine. Um, so, um, thank, so, you. thank you for the comment or any questions. So the next person is Kirsty. Uh, that's great. If you ask your question. Hi, Grace. Yeah, right. thank you for chatting to us. I'm, I've got some comments and questions, but I'm going to try and not <laughs> rant too much because I've just this has been amazing for me. Um, and I love I'm, I'm actually learning at the moment um celtic shamanic drumming and journeying yes so as soon as you said that i was like oh my god yeah this is me um so it is i i love how you've kind of brought them together as well um and the kind of the first comment was have you heard of i'm involved with um a conference called trans states and they've been going about two years. I can pop it in chat for you, but they're basically all about the esoteric in art and trying to challenge the kind of the ivory tower sort of thing within academia, um, but looking at esotericism and spirituality and witchcraft and all those kind of things. It's really, really interesting, but all through performance art, music, video, the whole lot. So really, really fascinating. But um so what was that what was I going to ask yes um so your kind of shamanic drumming sort of sessions are obviously very participatory and then to go to something like video art is quite you've suddenly got this screen you've got this distance do you find that they work well together or do you find that they're, they're quite opposing I mean, they're very different mediums. Um, but remember, I started with video art. You know, I started my first performances is when I put myself in trance and I, you know, would do it in front of the camera. And then because I would do like uh, long travels, let's say to the Sahara with Tuareg and nomadic people, I would start to have videos. I made a series of videos called Responsible Tourism, which I showed at the Chisholm Hale actually where I'm behind the camera and I'm interacting with what's in front. So there was always this like inside outside dialogue happening. Um, and then it just went into live performance, you know, and honestly doing sham shamanism was the only natural way that I could go into performance. Cause like I said, I, I wasn't interested in theatricality or acting, let's say. So um, for me, every medium has its time and place you know you know it, it there isn't well from my personal practice there isn't one medium that fits all you know you've got to know when to use what but I, what helped was I did specialize in video for like 10 years I told myself I need to know one medium very well you know yeah. so that's what I did I spent a long time making videos um you can find them on Lux uh, website you know, um, videos like The Nightingale or Absolute Native. So videos that were about political subjects, yes, there would be textiles in them, there would be words, writing, music, but it was video art. And so, and I did that on purposely because, yeah, I just think it's really important to have a craft, you know? And so, um, especially because when I didn't, when I went to Ateliers, everybody else had studied fine art. I'd studied textile art. So, you know, that was, you know, my background's not painting, it's fashion and text, it's very different, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so then I, um, I specialized in textile art for, yeah, 10 years. And then from that, I, it gave me the confidence to be able to work in any medium, you know? So now I just, you know, will think, oh, this idea fits a, an essay better, or this makes work makes sense in painting or this makes you know and so now it's a natural thing to work in different mediums um yeah okay lovely thank you thank you for that question Kirsty. brilliant um can we have liliana lilian ozelichki ozelichki or and then pasha so liliana uh, how, is, how do you say your name um, lilian ozelichki Azolchi. Okay, yeah. great. 
Um, I just wanted to say thank you for this artist talk. Like, I really enjoyed it and it was great. Your art is amazing and it's inspirational. Um, but I wanted to ask, this is kind of like a really vague question, so you can literally kind of go anywhere with it, but um, what would you say, like, what medium of art kind of got the most successful audience response to you? That, that's an interesting question. Um... That's hard to say, isn't it, really? Because, yeah. like, you know, for example, one of my early videos, The Nightingale, that's in the collection of The Met, you know, in New York. And that's had a quarter of a million people back then saw it in the first show. So is, is that more successful than 10 women who go on a shamanic, pregnant women who go on a shamanic journey? I don't know. I mean, I guess yes and no. Like, you could say number-wise it, it is, but... You know, the nice thing about what happened at the Met was that this is it, this is a funny story because this video is um, a video where I use um, a textile cloth and it, I kind of change identities with the video and um, and it's got African music. And so in the Met, there was um, a curator who wanted to do a show about African textiles. And so they invited me to show the video. It was the first time they'd ever shown a video in that department. So it was quite a big deal. And then it became kind of a bit of a controversy because I didn't want headphones on the video. I just wanted the music to go into the galleries. But then the Greek galleries next door, you know, with all the statues and stuff, they didn't want this African music wafting into there. <laughs> So then the curator really had to like fight for this, <laughs> my right to just have this music floating wherever it was, you know, and so it became kind of a political issue, you know, behind the scenes, you know, and then what was really nice, one of the invigilators was this really old woman who'd been like working there for like 30 years, or whatever, 40 years, and she told me she never liked video art. She like really hated, like she, did, you know, because in the Met there's a contemporary section as well, but she always, you know, preferred classical art until she saw my video. And then after that, she was like, oh, now I, I, I think I understand video art and I like video art. So in that way, it makes you feel good, doesn't it? You know, that you could change someone's mind after that many years working in a museum, you know, so they're little, they're small victories, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's a great. Yeah, thank you. Great question. And now Pasha. Pasha Kincaid. Hi. 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 I'm here with my daughter. Um, we both went to see the show Silver City at Nottingham on okay, Saturday okay. and we absolutely loved it. And I've got so many questions, so I'm going to try and keep it up. <laughs> Really. You've got you, you, you 11 minutes, 11 minutes starting from now. <laughs> you said something about um, exhaustion and social practice. And I just wanted to ask you about care, about how how can you take care of yourself in that context? Um, yeah, my, my work deals with social practice and race and quite is sometimes quite vulnerable. So I can relate to that sense of exhaustion and sharing. Um, just wanted to know about care. Yeah, I mean, I think before, you know, because obviously you, you, your career goes in different stages. At the first, the first time, you know, you only do one show a year, then you do two, and then you know what I mean. And now it's like everything at the same time. So, and remember, because I work in all these different mediums, yeah, you can get a bit intense, like <laughs> in that sense. Um, so. Specifically, so when I'm doing these shamanic performances, I get a lot of energy from it. You know, in the moment I can get like a lot of it because I give energy, but I also get a lot of energy in the moment. What What's hard is when it's a social practice project that lasts for months, right. you know? So if it's for one night, cool, or two days, but if it's like for four months, yeah. It's much more different. Like, so I'm doing this project on land arts at the moment at Kunsthal Ghent. Yeah. Um, you can look online. It's called Ghent, How to Live Together. And yeah. it's about a land dispute um, about the building that Kunsthal Ghent is in. It's in an old church. And part of it belongs to the city, part of it belongs to the province. Uh, there's a bit of it that kind of has social housing on the complex. And 
the government wants to sell it and that, you know, most likely to a property developer. And then now there's young squatters who are squatting it. You know, it's a very complicated project. And so this kind of project takes a lot of time. You know, I've been doing it since January because you have to phone everyone, you have to email people, you have to meet people. Then I organized um, five different events, let's say, um, things from film screenings to therapeutic, I call it therapeutic town hall meeting, um, to a public debate, to a reading room, holistic reading room. And so I'm leading all of those things uh, as well and we also built an archive about the history of the building that we had you know um, made so with this kind of project it's very complicated because there's so many people involved whereas let's say at Nottingham that kind of project is it's it it, it took two years to do it but you, you're de I'm dealing with Apart from the times when we had to meet like the eight of us, you know, to have a workshop. In the beginning, we had like two workshops in real life and then everything else was online. So we probably had seven workshops altogether over the two years. And then, um, then the install period, you know, that's different because on a daily basis, I'm talking to maybe one or two people, like the curator and the assistant curator, you know. And then we're dealing with objects because it's mostly objects in the space. Mm. Um, so it's a different type of energy. You don't lose as much energy. But when it's about organizing, let's say more activisty kind of work, yeah. then it gets exhausting. So then that's where I know my limit, you know, in terms of care, you know, because I've been doing it like straight now for since 2017. A lot, a lot of projects. And so it's kind of nice what's happened with the pandemic because, you know, there was a huge shift and now many people are interested in social practice or justice or, you know, community. So it means that actually I can take a bit of a break because there's lots of people doing it. Like before when I was doing it, I felt kind of alone or there's just a few people like Catherine Baum and, you know, some of the artists in, in the book, you know, who were doing it and we would support each other. But now many people are doing it. It's kind of like, you know, I can I can have some time off from it. <laughs> it's not like the world's gonna be better within like two months, so. <laughs> I think my daughter Joy wants to ask a question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just, I wanted to ask about your use of spirituality in your work. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I really love about it is I feel like especially with topics of race and social politics, it, it, it's working with trauma and often you can kind of trigger people's trauma in the process, like, as yeah. a yeah. like that, and it's difficult to navigate. But what I love with spiritualism is there's like, there's a healing aspect to it and it can transform trauma, I feel, into power. So I was interested in kind of use of spirituality and, and why why you combine everything? Well, for, for what exactly what you just said, that it should be transformative, you know? I mean, I think all art should be transformative in some way, you know? And my way was to, you know, bring my spiritual practice and my political beliefs and my love of aesthetics and beauty together, you know? Um, but yeah, when dealing with um, heavy subjects, because for example, I did one uh, one of the healing um, museum um, pro projects. I did this thing called a meal for my ancestors, which was a particularly focused on healing trauma. This was after uh, the bombing in Brussels and the refugee crisis in Syria had started. You know, and I started working with refugees and activists, and I gave them. Uh, four months free of meditation classes and then I was working with people who work in agencies you know like the UN NATO and the EU parliament and then I was giving them other classes creative visualization classes and then I brought them together to do this performance after four months and to, to do a conference and so yeah when you're working with you know trauma you yeah you have to know what you're doing 
you know, because you're really asking people to trust, you know, what I'm doing is not entertainment, it's a real thing, you know, you really do go on a shamanic journey, it's not for fun. And so I only do it when it's a political reason or a social reason, not just because I want to do it, you know, but also everything that I've done, I ask people to do, I've done, you know, hundreds of times myself. So I don't ask people to do things I haven't done before. You know, so you have to be careful when working with other people energetically, you know, and mentally, because people can be fragile, you know, may have mental illness or, you know, you don't know what they're like at home, you know, their, their living conditions, you know, like, for example, with the pregnant women, they all had to be second and third trimester, because I don't want to risk the first trimester because of, you know, you don't know what will happen. And then also I give very strict protocols about not being able to drink, not being able to take drugs, you know, in the few days beforehand. So it's, it's a, you have to be very responsible. Um, yeah, I would say that's my way of doing it. Obviously every artist is different, but that's, I would just say that's my way of working with it. Thank you so much. I wanted to say, please continue, keep going with the filmmaking. <laughs> for the black beauty um and black beauty journeys just like exquisite it was such a i just love your way of using new worlds to shine a light on like the surrealism of our reality and the strangeness to it so just go ahead okay thank you i've got permission i've got go more permission to go into make more films good yes <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. That's really brilliant question. We've just got time for one more question. Uh, and uh, it's Nicole Richards. So. Thank you. Thank you. Great Thank questions. You. Really great. So Nicole Richards, put your camera on. I don't, I try oh, to yeah. keep it on. Um, we can't see you, but anyway, we can hear you. So that's good. Um, okay, my question is, I'm not sure if you answered this, but um, what made you, because you went from like doing videos and then went into performance, like what made you feel like you had to or want to make that shift? I mean, I'm, it's just intuitive. I'll be honest, I'm a very intuitive person. I'm not a strategy type of artist, let's say. <laughs> so in terms of even career, you know, like, I went to Ateliers because someone had said it could be interesting, you know, but like all I wanted to do as a kid was to go traveling, you know, as a teenager. Yeah. I, I didn't even want to be an artist. I didn't even know you could be an artist. I didn't know it was a real job <laughs> until I got to Ateliers. And then I was like, Ooh, okay, this is a real job. And then I tried to quit halfway through. Honestly, after the first year, I was like, okay. I like it, but I, I want to go traveling kind of thing. And then the director like started, with, literally went mad and started shouting at me and was like, you're not quitting. Da, 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 da. And, like, and then, I, then I took it seriously, you know, but it was only because he made me realize, you know, or see that, oh, this is something I can do that I'm good at, you know, otherwise I would have just gone be surfing on a beach somewhere, I don't know. <laughs> and so I think who you meet really influences you you know, which teachers you have or th that really helps, you know. So like I said, I had a very good wide range of teachers and they just, I mean, they still inspire me now. So I think if you meet, yeah, meet the right people or, you know, read the right books or something, then yeah, you'll, you'll know what to do much easier. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's a great question as well. Well, so that brings us nice and neatly to three o'clock. So um, can you all switch your cameras on and give, and your, and the microphone on, give, uh, that's lovely, switch it all on and <laughs> loads of people. That's great. And um, just join me in thanking, put your hands together and thank Grace for the beautiful We all like start clapping and like everybody. <laughs> If you're at De Montfort, go to the library and get the book. And um, yeah, and, it, and go to Nottingham and see the exhibition.
And, and by the way, Grace is not doing any more talks for the year. So we've, we've been very, very lucky um, because she's going to, you know, work. Um, are those are those essays um, available, the ones that you referred to, Grace? Yeah, yeah. If you go on my website, if you scroll down, they're all listed there and you can read them there. Brilliant. And so I think, yeah, that might help you, you know, um, from what you were saying. You might, yeah. And then the book, um, you know, I think everybody, that's for anybody could read that and stuff. So... <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you. <laughs> thanks for coming. Oh, thanks. I'll stay on, Lola. Yeah, stay on. We'll just say thank you bye. so much, Grace. That was amazing. Yeah, thank you, Hugo. I that really appreciate it. Sorry, we, we got there with the imagery. It kind of worked. It was good. <laughs> but yeah, it was, a, it was a brilliant talk. I've got a daft. I've got to go and collect my daughter. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop recording at this point. Recording, yeah. Uh, uh, and then I will leave you guys. should be able to keep talking, I think. We have the recording.